Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for, for bearing with us. We had some uh, technical problems there, but we, we think we've sorted them now. So uh, thank you very much for sticking with us and I'm delighted that you can join us uh, today for our lunchtime webinar, the latest in our series uh, focused on the theme of sustainable power. Our speaker today is Dr. Mosin Lahuti, who is a research associate at the Department of Aeronautics uh, here at Imperial College. Uh, where he's developing a, a high fidelity numerical method for wall resolved fluid structure interaction simulation of wind turbine blades and that work is part of the EU funded high performance computing in wind energy project. Prior to joining Imperial Mosin worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Applied Fluid Mechanics Lab at the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology. He has more than 10 years experience in computational fluid dynamics and has a particular interest in renewable energies with a special focus on wind and hydro turbines and bio inspired fluid dynamics. So before I pass over to Mosin for today's uh, webinar, just a quick word about how it will work. So Mosin is going to speak for around uh, 30 minutes or so, and then uh, he will take some of your questions. To submit a question, use the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. It's a text box and you can submit uh, your question along with your name. But remember this uh, event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel uh, later. So if you do want to submit your question an anonymously, you can do that as well. So with that, I will pass over now to Mosin for today's lunchtime webinar. Uh -huh. Hello everybody, thank you for having me here. I'm honored to be here and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, can you see my presentation right now? Uh, I shared my screen, so. Uh, uh, yeah, we can see that now, thank you. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, an important design aspects in the wind turbine simulation. Uh, with the title keeping the lights on after the storm simulating long uh, large wind turbine in above the uh, design wind conditions we are all aware of the global warming effect uh, and the importance of the renewable energy the content of co2 is increasingly um, is increased uh, steadily uh, in the atmosphere and the g8 government announced that we have uh, to reduce 20 uh, to, to, to produce 25% of our electricity from the renewable sources by 2025 eu is targeting 80% emission in the um, uh, uh, by 2025 and a new economic model that is more uh, renewable. Uh, UK is one of the uh, leader countries in use of the renewable energy. It has the largest installed capacity of uh, offshore wind turbine with the 10 gigabyte in operation and uh, targeting to triple it by 2030 to reaching 30 gigabyte. They uh, recently announced the plan to reach the net zero emission by 2050. Uh, that, that's all great and we have to work very hard to achieve this. But uh, looking at the energy demand, according to International Energy Agency, we have 2.3 grew in energy consumption just in 2018, which is basically for the heating and uh, cooling, the demand for the electricity grew even faster, reached 4% 4, 4 in 2018, and the electricity uh, and that uh, contributed 2.5% to the CO2 emission. Continuing this trend would put us uh, on a 2.6 degree uh, or beyond in 20. 50. Uh, we should appreciate that these kind of uh, changes, if it happens naturally, it would be over a time period of a millennium. But we're doing these in 20, 30 years, which is terrible. And we have to uh, increase our um, use of uh, sustainable energy sources. Basically, we have four uh, uh, sustainable sources. Uh, hydropower, wind, solar and bioenergy uh, from all the electricity uh, produced from the renewable sources in the UK. The wind uh, is the major one with the 53% of the electricity. The important part here is the cost. Uh, in the recent auction, the strike auction um, reduced by half uh, the strike price reduced by half in the recent auction, which means that we can have, a, you can see it in the right figure, uh, we can have way cheaper electricity. It's already, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's already beaten the nuclear um, cost and it will be cheaper 
the electricity generated from the wind. It would be cheaper than the um, traditional gas power plant. However, we uh, we would have uh, situations that uh, turbines fails and that goes to the maintenance and um, maintenance cost and repair cost. Uh, here is few example from the China a typhoon uh, destroy the farm. This, the first example you, you can see here uh, while, while I'm talking about this, uh, you can see a blade uh, flowing in the air, uh, flying in the air after the tornado uh, hit that turbine. So uh, um, this is not from that form, but still uh, you can get the idea. So a tornado uh, hit the form, 30 blade was destroyed out of 75, so it, it was almost 50% of the blades, uh, blown eight towers, burned 33 to one. In, in, in the case of that particular um, uh, incident, uh, the total farm was destroyed, left uh, 70 million dollar, about 60 million pound uh, damage to the thing. So we we need to take into account for the new uh, modern wind turbine, uh, new consideration for the design to avoid such cases as much as we can, and uh, that help us to have cheaper and more uh, steady industry for the producing electricity from the wind. Uh, generally, the wind energy, uh, to extract the wind energy, we're using um, wind turbines. We installed them uh, in, in a bunch called, uh, in, in several, collection of several of them. Uh, we, we put them together, we call them uh, wind plant or wind farm, and uh, in an appropriate areas uh, to extract the wind power, we would have uh, several of these wind farm span over uh, several kilometers. Um, the, the power that we can get from the wind by definition is the energy over the time and is one half uh, rho AV3, uh, which is the power pro would be proportional to the area and to the uh, cubic power of the velocity. Uh, this, uh, White areas here, it's like clouds. These are the low velocity regions after the wind passes the uh, turbine. Uh, the, some phenomena called wake generated. It has lower velocity than the incoming uh, wind flow. And that's why these uh, turbines and these farms are uh, located staggeredly to avoid being uh, each of these turbine being in a directly in a wake of another turbine as much as we can manage to increase uh, the output of the the farm. Looking at the global uh, map, uh, because the power is proportional to the velocity uh, cubic meter of the velocity, suggested that we we have to build these wind farms in in the location of high wind velocity which as you can see basically are coastal areas and they are prone to experience uh, tropical cyclones, storms, typhoon, hurricanes. These are different names, but uh, basically they are the same thing, high velocity wind with changing direction and high amplitude gusts. Uh, so this is the classification for North East Pacific and North Atlantic. Um, you can see we, we have tropical depression, tropical storm, and then the hurricanes in, in the east, the, the, the hurricane part called typhoons. Uh, but uh, the basic feature here is that um, the wind turbine, a uh, special character of wind turbine is, is this curve that called the power curve. Uh, it has three distinct region, the cutting region, the rate at the speed and the cutout. The cutting is when the velocity is typically three, four meter and the turbine can start working and uh, uh, extract the power. The rated region, which uh, which has uh, typically 11, 14 meter per second, um, that uh, turbine to work as a rated uh, in its rated speed and uh, in its design condition. And when the wind typically reaches 25 meter per second, we have a cutout, we shut down the turbine. And in a good portion of this, we are in tropical depression and partly in, uh, by definition, in a tropical uh, storm. Beyond that and beyond the 32 meter per second, we are in the hurricane typhoon part and the turbine would totally be shut down, but still it's prone to have failure and damages, as, uh, as I will speak about. 
The modern wind turbine is based on the Danish design. Basically, they have uh, three blades. Um, the tower is high because uh, getting larger and larger because to put the uh, because the power was proportional to the velocity and we want to uh, put the turbine in a part of the atmosphere that has the higher velocity. The blades getting long, longer, reaching 80, 100 meters, which means the rotor diameter is uh, approaching 200 meters. And um, to increase the area because the power was proportional to the area, these are massive uh, structure and because of their size, um, and their weight, they, they are flexible structures um, that can have uh, new physics, that can introduce new physics into the design of the wind turbine. An important part, um, yeah, I lost another slide, but uh, let me explain it here. An important part uh, on this uh, wind turbine is the yaw system that uh, um, align the, the, the face of the turbine to the wind and that can have some misalignment or deactivation due to the turbine or malfunctioning or for the maintenance. Um, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. So basically how it extracts the energy when we have the flow over the um, blade sections, this is a blade section called airfoil, uh, we, we have a low pressure area and a high pressure region and the difference between this pressure produces lift and drag. It's a bit different. Uh, how we use this lift and drag is a bit different from that the airplane works. Uh, typically, the lift is uh, tilted forward, and this uh, small part of the lift is used to rotate the blade, and most of the, the forces uh, goes to the bearing, do nothing. But because it's an out-of-plane force, this is uh, this would be the for, uh, plane of the rotor. Uh, it is out of the plane force, so this uh, uh, tend to have a potential to to uh, to bend the blade. Uh, anyway, uh, we're using the fluid forces to rotate the uh, blade, and uh, by rotating the blade, rotate the generator and extract, uh, uh, converting the wind energy to the electricity. That's pretty cool. But in certain situations, these forces can be problematic for us. Uh, we have situation in the uh, fluid dynamic that um, when the when we have flow over so, uh, some bodies called the bluff bodies, which has the uh, large separated areas, uh, the flow can uh, have vortex shedding over them. So that means that, as you can see, for example, in this one, uh, it's a, a circular cylinder can be taught as a cross section of the tower or in this uh, right movie here, it's a flow over the airfoil over the angle of attack 20. We have a complicated vortex shedding and vortex interaction. Here we will have um, the time varying uh, vortices with the, the blue one is uh, clockwise, the uh, red one is counterclockwise. And this phenomena uh, result in having uh, oscillatory forces. So the lift and drag become varying over the time. For example, in this uh, example, that uh, the flow over the uh, cylinder, you can see the lift are uh, changing and also the drag, the, the net uh, mean uh, time uh, average of the lift is zero, but uh, its amplitude is changing over the time. It depends on the frequency of the uh, vortex shedding and the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a non-dimensional number, uh, number in fluid dynamics uh, proportional to the velocity and the characteristic length of the structure here is the uh, diameter of the cylinder. So what's the problem here? When we have these oscillatory forces, a phenomenon called uh, locking can uh, occur. That's happened when we let the structure to move. So the we have a frequency of motion of the structure. We have a frequency of the uh, vortex shedding. These two frequency, if they can, if they get close to each other, the vortex shedding frequency can lock into the structural motion frequency, and when it happens, uh, the vortex shedding frequency is controlled solely by the structural motion frequency. The forces 
frequency become near the uh, structural and natural frequency and can lead to undamped uh, to the resonance, which is an undamped vibration. And as you can see in the movie, it led to a structural um, failure. So this is a very important phenomenon and it's the root of many of our problem here. Uh, I showed I showed it with a very simple example in it, uh, this simple situation uh, that can happen over several parts of the uh, turbine blade. When we have a storm, we, 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 we usually put the blades, put the turbine in a part condition because uh, turbines are aerodynamically brake devices, which means that we uh, change the direction of the blade, the pitching of the blade, so they face uh, the velocity in a vertical direction, and this um, reduces the torque that uh, rotate the blades. So here, uh, we should have the part condition and the blade not rotating. But the yaw system, because uh, maybe it malfunctioned, because it uh, maybe um, the wind changing direction is too much and it cannot cope up with the uh, wind direction, can misfunction and we may uh, reduce this braking effect. In any case, uh, especially in a case of the high wind, uh, high velocity winds and the storm that we may experience, even if in the parked condition that the blade doesn't rotate, we may experience the vibration of the tower, the uh, flap wise bending, the blue one, the flap wise bending of the blades or flap wise vibration or the edge wise vibration depends on the direction of the wind and the amplitude and it's um, a little bit complicated, but generally it's, it's a general picture that we would experience here. So uh, you can see here, uh, the second blade is uh, bent and failed totally because of the wind. The storm doesn't, it's not even that close, but uh, the wind direction and the wind amplitude is high enough. At the same time, if you uh, look closely here, you can see the vibration of the tip. This tip all, uh, already failed and we have a vibration here and we have a bending here. So in these high velocity phenomena, um, practically uh, one or all of the blades can, can fail and uh, make damages to the turbine. Current approaches for um, considering these account in, uh, for the design of the modern wind turbines is basically using, uh, for the tower, they use the high-rise uh, building design tools and the codes uh, to tower sizing, which means that, that we have some tools and some empirical uh, relation that are modified to be used for the wind turbine design, but basically because the uh, material of the wind turbine and the uh, buildings uh, like towers are, are different, these are working, but they are not in their optimized uh, level and they can lead to, for example, tower collapse or snap of the tower of the structure. Very recently, uh, actually the evidence uh, was uh, speculated from 2006, 2006 that um, we may experience some kind of uh, vibration over the blade, but the first uh, academic uh, showcase that uh, used the 3D geometry of the turbine uh, was in 2016 and showed that uh, using the large bl blade in park condition can have a dangerous undamped edgewise vibration. The available tools for simulation of such a cases and taking into uh, account for the for the design process is basically based on the bl blade element theory or similar approaches and that's they are appropriate for the cases that the turbine is um, rotating and producing power, not appropriate for where, where they are in a parked condition and the blades are in standstill, they don't have any um, rotation velocity. And we have massive uh, flow suppression behind this and these uh, tools are uh, low fidelity, they cannot capture such a phenomena and uh, even they can uh, solve the problem for the standard steel condition, they are not still able to uh, correctly capture the physics. Uh, for the edgewise vibration, 
we have many open questions and uh, but we don't know the answer deeply we we know that the edge wise vibration uh, is related to the lock locked in phenomena i explained uh, just a couple of slides before the vortex shedding and periodic loading uh, happens over the blade it uh, it can be at various angles uh, for example here you see we have inclination angle the inclination angle is this uh, uh, blue angle that i show you it's a uh, different from the uh, angle of attack uh, i'll show you that later a bit later anyway in these two cases where the blade is uh, flexible and the flow passes over it uh, with the inclination angle zero, which is uh, normal to the blade and inclination angle 55, which is uh, the wind tilted toward the root of the blade. Uh, you can see we have massive suppression and the vortex shedding. So these are the vortex shedding phenomena. You can see uh, several uh, here is four uh, vortices that shed over the blade. And that means that we have um, the periodic force on the structure. The problem here is that it's very difficult to correlate these vortex shedding and their frequency to the um, wind uh, condition and the structural uh, frequency. Why? Because in the case of the circular cylinder that you saw previously, even if the blade doesn't, uh, even if the cylinder was uh, stationary, we would have uh, the vortex shedding over the structure. And when we let the uh, cylinder to move, we also had the vortex shedding over the structure. However, in the case of the turbine blade, um, for example, in this particular example that I put here, uh, when we have inclination angle and we consider the blade as rigid one, we do not see uh, the vortex shedding over a large part uh, span of the uh, blade and only just near the root, that tiny part at the bottom, uh, we, we have uh, uh, vortex shedding. Basically, the vortices are stationary over the blade, so there is no shedding and it's very difficult to correlate this to uh, when the structure is moving on the right side. It's considered to have motion flexible uh, flexibility. This is called wa uh, wake reconfiguration. So when it's rigid, we don't see any shedding. When we let it to move, we see the shedding. Uh, the effect of the tip, the effect of the three dimensionality is not uh, completely understood in this uh, situation. We have a, a principle called the independence principle, which says that um, basically to have the vortex shedding, uh, the, the normal component of the velocity is important. But in that case, you can see um, in, situ in some situations, uh, the, the component of the velocity that along the span of the structure is also important and uh, have effect on having this vortex shedding resulting in the periodic forces that can be uh, very dangerous and having a very large amplitude uh, vibration of the blade. So uh, using computation and modeling to address such a simulation, there are uh, they would be for two purposes. First, we are to understand what's actually happening, and second, considering and uh, computing the uh, design cases, the dangerous cases, and uh, considering in the design to avoid, even if they happened uh, in the real uh, lifetime of the turbine. You can see here on the, in the picture that uh, in one of these situations, this is a very massively separated flow uh, over the blade. We need high fidelity tools to capture this phenomena uh, accurately and compute the forces. Uh, for the wind turbine, the Reynolds number usually is very high, is order of uh, 10 to 6 to 10 to 7. Um, and we have anisotropic uh, turbulence over the blade. They are massively separated. And in this situation, when we want to see, do the simulation of such cases, uh, the number of degree of freedom, the number of variable that we have to solve, which is depend on the mesh size, is increased by Reynolds power to nine to four, which is a very large number. And the flops uh, floating uh, operation per second also scales by the Reynolds to three. 
and considering Reynolds uh, 10 to 6 and 10 to 7, you, you can uh, imagine how expensive these uh, high fidelity simulation would be. We need, uh, of course, and, and it's not enough to just simulate the structure with some empirical courses, empir uh, empirical forces, forces that uh, somehow we get from the experiment or um, estimation from the analysis, uh, analytic uh, expressions. Uh, and we need to have, uh, and it's not enough also to just uh, simulate the flow, as you, as you saw, uh, in some cases with the only flow, it doesn't shed and uh, it predict that we are safe, but we are not. So we need a high resolution, high fidelity, uh, fluid structure interaction to address this uh, phenomenon and understand better what's happening. Um, what I'm doing here is uh, developing an efficient high fidelity numerical approach for fluid structure interaction. Uh, I'm using LES or DNS uh, for fluid simulation and geometrically exact nonlinear um, composite beam solver for the structural. Uh, as it uh, appears from its name, it's fluid structure interaction. So we have a fluid solver. I'm using Nectar++, uh, 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 fluid solver that's developed at the in Department of Aeronautics Imperial College. It's a high order spectral element method uh, support 3D arbitrary geometries tailored to uh, for highly turbulence and separated floats. It's highly scalable. Remember the flops is uh, increased with power three of Reynolds. So it's very important that we can have a efficient HPC computation. Uh, the solver is cross platform and it's open source for the structural solver. Uh, the formation of the blade. Uh, I'm using SharpEye, another uh, open source tool that is developed at Aerolastic Lab uh, at the Department of uh, Aeronautics. Uh, it's a stands for simulation of high aspect ratio aircraft and wind turbines in Python. Uh, uses the geometrically nonlinear beam formulation. It can uh, uh, simulate static and dynamic simulation, support multi bodies, and the computational core is very efficient, uh, written with in Fortran and C++, and uh, it has a robust uh, user interface in Python. So to increase the uh, efficiency and have practical simulation, what, what I'm uh, doing is uh, using, a, representing a three full three-dimensional domain with the several a smaller uh, still three-dimensional domain, discrete three-dimensional domain. Each of them, uh, we call it strips. This is a continuation of a previous work done here, uh, Bao et al. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the reference is not here because of I had to use an older version of this presentation because of the uh, difficulty that we have. Anyway, uh, each of these strips has a finite length in the direction of the uh, in the z direction, the spanwise direction of the structure. It allows us to have the uh, to capture the three dimensionality, local turbulence three dimensionality. If we don't have that uh, thickness, we wouldn't see the three dimensionality of the flow, and the flow in each section would be two dimensional. Uh, the uh, prediction of the forces wouldn't be accurate. The uh, turbulence is a three-dimensional uh, phenomenon, and it's important to capture uh, this. So these discrete uh, strips are connected to each other via the structural dynamics. Uh, the blade are slender uh, structures, so the length over the cord over this uh, length is very uh, larger than one. Uh, in SharpEye, we represent these with several elements. Each element would have three nodes and using the finite element to solve the beam structure. The coupling is that uh, we have the location and velocity and acceleration of the structure. We pass it through the fluid solver, solve the velocity and pressure. Then in each of these strips, we calculate the forces, the lift and drag on the structure interpolate them uh, consistently on the location of the uh, structural nodes. And uh, now on the structural part, we have the forces from the fluid and we can solve it, to, uh, evolve the dynamics of the structure in one time step and continue this coupling to have a simulation over the time. 
uh, I mentioned LES uh, several times. LES is a large eddy simulation uh, as a method in um, fluid dynamics to for simulation of the turbulent flows. You can see it can give us the resolve the structure of the turbulence flow. It's computationally very expensive, but uh, if you want to have an accurate uh, representation, accurate prediction of the forces and flow features, uh, we have to use this. Another uh, more expensive uh, approach is the DNS that uh, eliminate that uh, some modeling that used in the LES method. Uh, here is a LES simulation of uh, flow over with Reynolds 150,000 or a wing. Uh, with eight degree uh, angle of attack. The angle of attack is the degree uh, from the incoming wind with the cord of this uh, airfoil. So for this simulation to get the uh, aspect that how, how much is, uh, does it take, uh, the runtime for eight physical second took 48 hours on uh, 192 uh, cores on college uh, CX2 HPC system. Uh, typically, I'm using 2000 core for 8 to 12 hours on UK natural supercomputer system Archer uh, for simulation. That depends on the physical time that I need to capture or the resolution of the mesh uh, and this kind of thing. So it's a very uh, expensive simulation, like 48 hours for just 8 seconds, and usually we need 50, uh, 75 seconds to capture. Uh, you, you can see at first, uh, at the first of the simulation, there is a transient time that should pass here. And then we can uh, rely on the uh, simulation results. So uh, it's important to have enough simulation, uh, physical simulation time. To, to understand, to get a better uh, understand of the cost, this is the domain, this tiny little uh, white line here is the airfoil and we're uh, to to uh, have a to manage the cost actually uh, we are using a very large element far from the airfoil and condense the mesh near the airfoil um, so here uh, we can capture uh, correctly the flow physics that this is important this part is actually important for us uh, to compute the forces because uh, we're doing the FSI and the forces are actually important for us. So we, we need to have a good resolution near the body. The, the outer part is not that relevant in this particular work, um, but it's it would be nice if we can uh, have the same resolution all over the domain. Anyway, uh, each of these planes have uh, 3500 uh, high order element with order five. The thickness in the Z direction is a, a quarter of the court with 24 of these planes leading to 84,000 elements. Now imagine if we want to simulate with the same resolution uh, a blade of 100 cord. So a blade that uh, its length is 100 of the cord of the airfoil. In that case, we would need uh, 9,600 planes, which ended up in 33.6 million elements, which means that using the thickest strip method, uh, for example, in that case, if we're using 20 of these blades, it would uh, result in 95% reduction of the elements, and but still it's very, very expensive for the simulation. Um, OK, uh, just one example from uh, my simulations to, to show you a little more about this uh, feature. This is a hail wing uh, similar to the blade, uh, high altitude, long endurance wing uh, with the Reynolds number uh, 150,000. The, the length of the uh, wing is 16 meter. To, for this simulation, I used four strips and uh, 24 plane in each strips. So you can see here, this is the angle of attack, uh, that uh, is the angle that the uh, velocity vector incident uh, uh, airfoil. So at the start of the simulation, this angle of attack is four for each of uh, the strips. For So for all of the fluid, we have the angle of attack four. When, um, 
another part that missing from the similar slide because of the technical. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the final result. And when the wing uh, deforms, I, I'll talk it about a little later. Uh, when the wing deforms, um, when when we have the flow, we have the forces over the wing, and the, this is the final deformation of the wing over the span. You can see uh, for this 16 meter wing, it deformed like three meter uh, in, in vertical direction. Uh, the red line here is a is from simulation from Sharpay. Uh, and using UVLM, uh, unsteady lattice, volt, uh, lattice vortex method, which is a low fidelity uh, simulation to, to predict the aerodynamic forces. Uh, it's uh, working, uh, both of these methods are predicting the same uh, result. They agree with each other very well. Uh, the question here is that um, now that we can use a low fidelity approach, why we bother to have a high fidelity one? Uh, in, in this particular case that I show here and I used for the validation of the code, uh, we have small angle of attack and even if after the deformation and where the structure twists at its roots and the angle of attack increase, it's not uh, the increase in the increase in angle of attack is not that much uh, that we have a hugely separated flows. Um, and because of that, the results are very uh, close to each other. But in the case of the turbine in a park condition that the angle of attack become near 90 uh, and we have massively separated flows, the method similar to the UVLM um, cannot capture the aerodynamic forces. To have uh, a taste of what's the computational cost for the red line, which is the sharp eye and the UVLM, you need one, two hour uh, on a simple laptop or desktop computer to calculate this uh, simulation. For my simulation, this particular this simulation that I'm showing here, uh, I used eight hours with uh, 4,800 cores on Archer to get uh, to compute this uh, simulation. Uh, on, on the left, you can see the uh, time history of the tip deformation. So after uh, about uh, 20, 20 seconds, uh, the tip uh, vertical location doesn't change anymore and we are in a steady state condition. You can see here the deformation of the wind and over the time uh, at first it changes very quickly and then over the time it reaches the steady state and uh, get the final uh, location. Because of the deformation of the, uh, the beam over the because of the fluid forces, uh, the angle of attack changes. And as the angle of attack changes, like from the first strip to the location of the last strip, the angle of attack increases by, by 75% from four, it reaches to about seven, 7.1 7 actually. And uh, with increase of angle of attack, we have the increase of the forces over the uh, section of the blade. The last part here is modeled actually with the, it's a tip effect because in this, in the real situation, because of the three dimensionality, we wouldn't have the, uh, the lift would be zero here, uh, but the thickest trick modeling uh, wouldn't allow us to see this. We need a three dimensional uh, simulation at this part. So we model this uh, simulation, this, this uh, part effect actually. And here is a, a flow simulation, a snapshot of the simulation at the final deformation. The deformation is not shown in, uh, it cannot be seen here, but uh, I enlarged the, each uh, strip section. This is the vorticity contours over it. So here we have angle of attack four and increase to angle of attack seven. You can see here the effect of the angle of attack. The, uh, the colors are the velocity magnitude. The maximum is 1.6. Uh, the maximum of the color band is 1.6. So uh, the more red means higher velocity. You can see here in angle of attack four, we, we started the separation at this part, at the middle of the uh, airfoil and uh, on the near the root, uh, near the tip of the blade, near the tip of the wing, uh, when, the, when we reach us to the angle of attack alpha uh, equal to seven, uh, the separation point, uh, moves to the uh, front of the airfoil called the leading edge of the airfoil. 
OK. Um, yeah. I lost the conclusion slide also because of this technical problem that we have. Um, let me conclude this uh, talk by saying that um, understanding the physics, both in atmospheric uh, motion and aeroelastic, uh, are two uh, of three grand challenges uh, uh, of the new modern wind turbine design. We, we discovered new um, and dangerous situation that can lead to the failure of the turbine. And um, we need high simulation and high fidelity tools to understand this phenomena better and to take into account these uh, situations in the design, avoiding uh, the failure. And uh, of course, uh, it would be longer um, lifetime for the turbine, and which means cheaper electricity, more sustainable, more cheaper. And um, my work is developing such high fidelity uh, tools. The work is supported by the HPCB project, uh, fund, European funded. And uh, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to work with professors uh, Rafael Palacios and Spencer Sherwin from the Department of Aeronautics. Um, I wanted to mention their name here and you can see their uh, faces. So. That's my talk and uh, I would be happy to uh, talk about if you have any questions. Anyway, the important message is that uh, the sustainable energy is very young. We have like uh, experience with the wind turbines and installing them over a co couple of decades. Uh, it's been more than 30 years, at least the uh, industrial part, but still we don't know many things, both in the physics parts, we need to explore very much and there is a lot of work need to be done, both in academic part and industrial part. It's an open uh, field of research that uh, it's um, very interesting, both academically and industrially, and it can affect our lives very much in the future. I hope uh, everybody uh, do whatever we can do about this situation that we created for the earth. Absolutely. And just before we go, I just see there is a, a, a question in there now if you want to take a look. OK. A uh, great presentation. You mentioned that Nectar++ Plus Plus can use a spectral FEM to model high Reynolds number. Have you considered possible negative uh, effect Gibbs oscillation of using high order finite element to model high uh, highly advective uh, PDEs? Have you seen any results with the spectrum have failed in sense in such regimes? Thanks. Um, th there are actually, uh, okay, I'm not developing this, uh, the finite, the, the fluid solver. Um, basically, my work is based on the coupling between these two solvers and modification of some part uh, fluid solver that related to this uh, coupling, of course. But base, the, the, the core of the uh, fluid solver, uh, it's already there and I'm using it. Uh, I haven't seen such phenomena. We have some uh, uh, tools uh, like using um, uh, a spectral, um, I forgot the total name, but uh, SVV. Uh, we use some damping uh, situation to control uh, an effect oscillation that may uh, occur in the simulation. So it's not. Uh, because of the high fidelity and uh, high resolution, um, many things that can happen, but uh, uh, no, I haven't actually. We, we use some particular um, filters and uh, things that take those uh, for now. Till now, I, I haven't uh, experienced such thing in my simulation at least. You, you can visit the uh, nectar plus plus uh, info.com. Uh, I, I put the link. Uh, in the chat, uh, can I? How can I put the link in the chat, Connor? Uh, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. 
sorry, if you if you um, copy and paste into the make an announcement uh, in the Q&A. Okay. So you can visit uh, the page and there are more um, information there. Uh, but for my situation, no, I haven't uh, experienced such, such cases. Okay, great. Well, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. We're, we're just about out of time and thank you. Um, thank you for, for, for sticking with us uh, through the through the technical problems and, and, and all of that. So um, thank you again to everyone watching at home and don't forget to, uh, to check out Energy Futures Lab and um, imperial.ac.uk forward slash Energy Futures Lab for, for future events. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.